we all we're gonna go live. We've got mm -hmm. black gun owners in education here today to talk about a few things going on in the Houston area after recent Hurricane Harvey. If you can see in the bottom of the screen, I've got Mr. Tactical Snowflake. I'll call him that for now. If he wants to introduce himself, <laughs> <the butterfly. laughs> you know, um, you know, Miss Tactical Snowflake. That's what you want to do. <laughs> But if you want to give them a formal introduction, man, go ahead and let everybody know who you are and you know, kind of give them an idea of what we're going to talk about here today. Okay. So today we're going to talk about, I'm not a survivalist. I'm only, I only play one here on Facebook. But what we're going to do is just mainly talk about what's going on down in Houston, um, talk about some of the armchair quarterbacking that people are doing uh, and second-guessing the mayor and his strategy as far as I'm not trying to evacuate a city of 6.5 million, but primarily what we want to talk about is, you know, how you're going to prep, how do you prepare yourself? Because I've got some great ideas um, for people who posted in the group. I just found out I'm not really prepared as I thought I was. Okay. So right. I'm going to talk about my exchange, my ideas. We know what do we need to do? Excellent. Excellent. I thank you for kind of setting things up. Uh, you know, I, just kind of touching on the basis, I'm not in the Houston area, but I've been trying to keep track of it as much as I can. And it was right. brought to my attention that there's a lot of looting going on kind of right mm -hmm. now. So I, how do you feel about the looting that's happening? Well, in the area? What, what we were talking about off air before we came on, I take General Russell Honoré's approach to this. Now, for those who are viewing, they remember Russell Honoré was the general that, that um, FEMA brought in, George Bush brought in to take over when the state of Louisiana and New Orleans kind of dropped the ball on the operational side of, of how to handle the post Katrina disaster. Right. So his approach was this, it's twofold. One, you got, you got, you got, you got two things. You got looters and you got people that's trying to survive. Okay. Looters and people trying to survive. So my mind, I take his approach. A looter is someone who's going into a store. I'm going to take money. I'm going to take um, a television set. I'm going to take shoes. I'm going to take, something along that lines. Where he was talking about people who are trying who are surviving, he was saying, okay, I'm not going to send my men to arrest a mother going into a drugstore to get formula for her baby. The the formula is going to perish anyway. Or I'm not going to stop a dad who's going to the public's grocery store in downtown Houston, for example, um, going to get some lunch meat, okay, which is going to perish. Okay, these these are items that are going to perish anyway. So I, I don't I don't really have an issue with that. Now there are some people who have going to have a little bit more have more dilemma on that. But the reason I say that is this: T take for example someone who go is is it the same moral equivalence? In other words, stealing some shoes during a flood or cash or some mother who says, you know what, I don't have any baby formula. The flood is up to my neck. My baby needs some milk. He needs some diapers. Okay, am I going to be pressed really hard about that? No, I think not. I'm fine with that. We can discuss. We can discuss the moral dilemma of that later. I'm cool with her doing that. I'm right. not fine with. I'm not fine with the guy that goes into a store, steals a television. Like, what the hell are you stealing a television for? The water's six feet high. Well, not to mention <laughs> electricity isn't really going. So how are you going to keep it dry? Yeah, what are you going into a store stealing money for? The water's six feet high. Where are you going to spend it? Exactly. Okay. You don't have anywhere to spend it immediately. So what are you doing? I mean, your first, to me, as someone who's trying to survive a flood, I've never had to survive one. And maybe we'll get someone in a comment section to talk about this because we got a few group members who are actually in Houston. My first thought is to first find some dry, figure out where do I get the dry land? Where is my food source? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because here's the thing about me. I live here in the metropolitan Atlanta area. I've got property that my family has willed to me down in Wilkes County, which is down more in East, East Georgia and Walton County on my mom, on my mom's side, which is also down in East Georgia too. I've got a storage of food down there because some of the farmland we still use down there, we still sell produce. So if something goes down here in Metro Atlanta, I can just take my, my bug out bag. I can leave. And I just found out I didn't really have a real bug out bag according to some group members. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> it it wasn't it wasn't because what because when I told some of the group members what it, what it consists of, I was like, that's not a damn bug out bag. That's just a a, a first aid kit and a knife, <laughs> basically. So you know that's my thought process on that. 
So I hope I answered that question. I didn't, I hope that didn't go on a tangent, but that's that's what I make the distinction of. Okay, well, it looks like we got Charles. Charles wants to join. Let me see if I can go ahead and get him in here. Hey, Charles, how you doing? Uh, let's see. Here. Well, while Charles is coming on, I'm going to get through. I was I was cleaning one of my Glocks before we went on. So. <laughs> Nothing's in the chamber. You know how some people are about that. So I'm just yeah, dusting. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's greatly appreciated. Yeah, so I'm going to finish doing this. Let's see if I can get him in. But the thing, that's, the thing that's really pissing me off on social media is this, and, and I hope you had a chance to post what I posted on my feed, this Monday morning quarterbacking of how do you evacuate 6.5 million people. Here's the, here's, the, here's the problem with everyone assuming it can be done. It's never been done. Okay? Yep. Never. Okay? When, it, when this happened in Katrina, nothing like this had ever happened before. There is no way to plan for something like that. It's easy to sit back and say, well, the mayor should have, he should have gone on TV and alerted people. There, there are people that don't have m enough money to put in a car to get out of Houston, number one. You've got to take into account... You have people who, let's go back to this. There are people who are, in, who are in hospice care. There are seniors who are infirm and can't get out. Okay. There, there are three hospitals in Houston. You've got to primarily evacuate those first. There are people who are terminally ill. Okay. Yeah. So you got to figure, so you, you got to figure out how do I evacuate these people? So then you got these folks that say, well, you got to, you should set the buses up to somehow run them into the neighborhoods and evacuate people. Well, damn, if you spend any time in the military, you know that's a clusterfuck. How, do, how are you going to coordinate that? How are you, you don't have enough buses. You don't have enough people. Even if you evacuated, let's, let's say if you had 300 buses at 50, that each bus holds 50 people. Okay, that's not even a million folks right there. You don't you don't have enough. So let's say you want to centrally coordinate it. So let's say you say, well, let's find the biggest location we can in Houston. Maybe that's Joel Osteen's church, and everyone's talking about him right now. That, so let's just that did happen. That, the Joel yeah. Osteen happened. At, uh, I would yeah. say social media yeah. got a hold to it, and he had to do something. At this point, right now, I believe that they're now taking donations. Right. Exactly. So let's say you use his church. He's, he'll say he's got the biggest parking lot in Houston. Okay. Right. The question remains, how do you, how do you effectively coordinate this? And anyone who spent time in the military, you know this, how do you effectively coordinate people coming in from different directions to one central location? And then you got to bust these people out to various locations. Never mind. Now, now, now get this. You've got the, you got the, you got the Houston Lake, which is one of the largest lakes, which has the, the levees have already broken that lake. Okay, they've already broke. Then you got then you got the you you got a ri river. The, the, it, it escapes me that that runs not from not from Houston out to the ocean, but runs in from the ocean into Houston. And the reason it does is because the city of Houston get this, get this. The city of Houston before it was settled was a swamp. It was a swamp in marshland. I didn't know that. Yes. The city of Houston was a swamp, was a big ass swamp in marshland. So, it's a, so essentially, essentially the water is simply taken back what was already there. Okay, so that's why you, anytime you've got coastal areas, and that are set up with these dikes, and these dams, that tells you it's already underwater. It's underwater. They, they put that that way. That's why. That's why you got all these dikes and levees in New Orleans. New Orleans is a fucking bowl. When you drive down, you've been to New Orleans before. You drive down into it. The reason it's like that is because it was. It, it's not naturally built like that. So you got to put the levees to keep the water out. So the water crests out of the lakes. It's already crested out of the lakes. It's flooded into the city. So how how do you prevent that from happening, genius? While you try to bust these people to a central location. See that that's that's no one's taking in, no one is taking into this into consideration. I get that you're frustrated. I get the, I'm, I'm angry about it myself. But but the point of the point a lot of, of the survivalists tell us is this and to their point is when a disaster like this happens, you can't depend on the federal government or the state government. You gotta have your own plan. You gotta have your own prep plan, and you need to run this over in your head, you need to plan with your family. What do I need to do in the case, for example, here in Georgia, 
we have a lot of tornadoes. We have ice storms. There was one. There was one time we had an ice storm. I'm not talking about the one that you know, guy. You guys were laughing at us about down here, which stuck everybody on I-20. I'm talking about years ago, back in early 2000, where we had one. Where all of Metro Atlanta was shut down with snow and ice, and you had people stranded in their cars that couldn't figure out, you know, how do I start a fire? I mean, grown men and women who didn't know how to. You know, <laughs> it's crazy stuff. You know, they were interviewing, they were interviewing grown men on the side of the road, and he, and this guy was like, "I don't, I don't have any food in my car. I just have this blanket." And I'm looking at it like, Doc, you got a tree right there. You can build a shelter, okay? You can build yourself a fire. And, and it didn't occur to me, like, you have, you have grown men and women that have, they don't have any real life skills outside of what they do at their, at their respective job. I mean, there's, you got guys that don't know how to start a fire with two flint rocks. So, That's a bad case. You know, that, yeah, yeah. So, Not to mention, uh, I mean, we're talking about survival skills and things that are necessary and needed. Um, I think being able to maintain your firearms is also a very important matter. Uh, just to kind of tie into it, they, there's a Florida, not a Florida, but a, a gator farm that they yeah. had. And because yeah. of the flooding, it's like 350 plus gators just floating around. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the other thing. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. You you got what you said about three hundred some gators, right? This was this was a yeah. This was a this was yeah. I, and I read briefly that on on a one on someone's post. So again, what's the contingent since since everyone's Monday morning quarterbacking what the what the city is doing there? What's your contingency plan? How would you would how would you dealt with eight hundred gators? I didn't know that, <laughs> and I'm sure uh, and I'm sure. The, Right. For I'm me, sure the mayor's people. I'm sure the mayor's the people didn't know this. One thing. I don't think I would want to be wading in any water. I would want to be floating if possible. Right. Um, some kind of flotation device that, that or, or something that allows me to stay out of the water. One of the two. Exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> so that's the story. So what else we what else we got here? Um well I, just to kind of keep things on topic and tie, tie it back into survival skills. Uh, I did come a across a, another post from um, Baba, Baba o Omo Wale. Uh -huh. In his case, he's got life rest. Uh, he's got the inflatable raft. He's got the, the paddle. Um, let me see if I can, can get a little more base on it just from the picture. But he's got everything that, that you would need in a situation like this. It looks like he, he's got first aid. It looks like he, he's, he's got things as far as rations covered. Um, mm -hmm. All of it's set up, and it doesn't look like it's a lot. I wish I, I could share the screen real quick just to kind of – let me see if I can pull that up. There we go. Uh, Bob is the kind of guy that should actually be um, probably posted – oh, wow. Yeah, wow. so I mean, he, he's ready. It looks to me, with his hands in that position, he's probably talking or discussing with somebody. You know. Um, now is he in Texas? Is he in uh, Texas? Let me see. Let me see. Houston, New Orleans. We went over this in our survival seminar. Oh, How wow. can you not own a boat and live that close to the ocean? You've got to stop buying twenty-four inch rims and get that get the shit that will save our lives. Exactly. The government, again, the government is not coming to say, it's not about, it's not coming to say black folks. There's white folks in in Houston and you see what's going on. The government, can, in a natural disaster like this, you can't depend on the government. The only person you're going to depend on is you. You, your neighbors, and making sure that y'all are coordinated with, with, a, with a successful plan. And I had this guy once tell me, he said, make a plan, put it in action, and stick to it. If the plan doesn't work, Make a plan, put in action, and stick to it. And that's what you and, and I I like what Bob is doing. That's, can you show me that again? Uh, let me let me pull it back up one second. Let's see. I got too many tabs open around here, man. Bob, I need to reach. I need to reach out to him myself and have him go over my um escape plan and see, and yeah, see if I'm, any flaws. Yeah, I'm definitely going to try to get him in the group, man, because that's that's right on the money. He hit it right on the head. Right. Those again, if you can see that. Okay, so he's got. Okay, so he's got the boat. What's the What's the orange stuff in the background? Orange, gray. It looks like some. I see the blue. The blue must be water jugs. Uh, 
or was it Otto's, all of these? Otto's life looks like vest. he has four, no, five life vests. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely. Gonna and what are the black? To figure out what else you know he's included in these packages because that that's information that's not common yeah. knowledge. If you look at the post, there's only 260 shares, uh, 27 comments. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. And it just kind of depends. I mean, if somebody's saying that an inflatable raft can cost anywhere from 100 to to $1,000. One in the photo, right. he indicates cost 120 and can carry four people. Right. And they, they don't cost much, I'll, be, I'll admit. I mean, I go, I go to a lot of um, pawn shops to buy my firearms here in Georgia. I see uh, them with, with life rafts, the inflatable ones. I've yeah. seen them go for as little as 200 some dollars. Um, probably like his, the ones that fit about five or six people. And I mean, these are, I forget the certification. They got this huge alphabet soup certification. They stamp on it to tell you that, hey, look, this thing is not going to puncture. It's going to be all right in this kind of storm and whatnot. And it looks like he's he's probably got one of them. I, I like it. Yeah, you, it's durability, I think, is important, man. You don't want anything that, that's not going to hold up to it and it's not going to carry the amount of people that you, you need it to carry. Mm. That's very important. Knowing how many people your raft can hold, how many people you can put in it, because uh, right. you don't want to get into a raft and it capsizes and flip over because you need that weight. And and ultimately the and ultimately the thing you need to you need to have is a firearm to protect yourself uh, and to protect your family exactly. when when stuff like this breaks down. Which is um, I I, I wish I could I wish I had a way to post a video from uh, my feed. Uh, of the guy, uh, you, I don't know. Maybe you can go to my my feed and pull it up on my Facebook page. There's a gentleman I just friended. He shot a video. Like I said, he's he's protecting some of his property um, from some guys who were just they weren't going in to get food. They were just going in to be asses and steal stuff. So he's standing outside with a shotgun. Um, Brother Tay is his name. All right, give me one second. So I, I, I believe I watched that video and th the part that. We're even here discussing it is because the main media, like the media outlets, aren't covering this side of things. No, they're not. No, they're not. See, see, they just got through interviewing some sister uh, at a Red Cross um, emergency emergency uh, site, and she cussed the reporter out. The, re she had, the reporter asked her, um, "Well, how do you feel?" I said, "Well, how the hell you think I feel?" Get she's <laughs> yeah. she told she told you know get the F they got get the F and Mike out of my face. And you know, sometimes reporters can ask some really stupid questions. Well, you know, you just lost everything. The coast just got hit by a category four. There's six foot to twelve foot water in some areas. Some areas is higher than that. And you're asking a person how do you well, how the hell would you feel? How how would you feel if you just lost everything? And the only thing you have on you are your clothes. You know, I already know how they feel. Ask them something. You know, a little bit more germane to to and a little bit more sensitive. It shows real low emotional intelligence to ask a question like that, in my opinion. I'm I'm sitting here thinking in, in shock, like, what would I say if I, I woke up to a situation or I had a, a situation where floodwaters wiped everything out? I I probably would have responded to something similar. Yeah, something you would have. You have. I mean, um, I. I I tell you what, I wouldn't have asked her. Well, how do you feel? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's probably one of the last questions I would have tried to put across. But uh, I right. got the the post here for you, man. I can actually play it now. Let's see. Yeah, play that. Play that. Our community, it's a shame. We need more real men out here to step up to protect where you live. This storm is temporary. You right. They are here club I love this guy. <laughs> yeah, he got a real bad shotgun in his hand. I'm telling you one time. I'm not scared to shoot you. I'm going to ask you one time. 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 I'm going to <laughs> and that's why you have a gun. That's right. Because when disaster happens, man, it, it's like things become lawless. Like people stop abiding by law. Well, 
right. There's there's no martial law. You are the martial law. One is out of there. It's either martial. And you hear that she she even said it. Ain't number one ain't coming. Listen to it. Law on everybody else watching. Man, I it's martial law right now, baby. There's no law. There is no law. I just said that. I just said it. Yeah. Yeah, that's all they. This is they trying to turn this into martial law. You heard that curfew? Yeah. They have a curfew. Well, I wonder what time that curfew is. Just well, curious. for obvious reasons, for obvious reasons, they got to have a curfew and something right. like that. But you know, if you're going to be some kind of idiot out trying to loot at night with six, twelve foot water and eight hundred gators just escaping, then more power to you. Yeah, I'm gonna hear some more of this video, man. Like he says some stuff. Yeah, in but, I think people d definitely need to catch if they haven't seen the video. If they yeah, haven't, they understand exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, play this. I'm gonna shut up. Oh, they're trying to take the man. Stole this man out here with his shotgun, y'all. It is yeah. not a game. HPD ride is back a jump truck right now, armed with AR 15s. Go back. Hey, put it down. Oh, oh my god. Nick, Nick, y'all, dude. Oh my god. Y'all, dude. Oh, you heard what he said about the, the officers in the back of a dump truck with AR 15s? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if these officers would probably open fire on the looters, but I know this. I know he's going to open fire on someone, obviously, because that's his property. And he's like, you know what? I don't want you going back into my place. So. Right. It it is what it is at this point. And that's why you that's why you have a gun to protect your property. So when some so when lawlessness like this does happen, you know you've got the means to protect things for your family and your community, and that's what he's doing. Because yeah. we, we don't we don't know what we don't know what he's got in that store. That say for example, we just got through talking about earlier. You might have a mom that needs some baby formula. Okay, but you got some you got some jerks like this who're going to come through and ransack the place. You know and. He may not be able to get to it. So, also, you know, I, I applaud him. Gets me to thinking, man, like, so in losing everything in the flood, what if you have a large mm -hmm. cache of weapons? How do you transport or keep your, I guess, your weapons safe? Because from what I understand in Katrina, they started confiscating firearms at some point. Then. Yeah, and a lot of people d don't talk about what happened in Katrina when the feds went house to house. And here's something I often, often notice in this, this uh, the gun association um, web, excuse me, on Facebook page. People will always post, well, don't post pictures of your firearms because that lets the government know what you have, or don't post pictures of your firearms that lets someone in your neighborhood know, or other people. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I can I can go with maybe not posting because you don't want your next door neighbor to know. But odds are your next door neighbor probably does know. Okay. Or you don't want some guy in a different neighborhood knowing. Okay. Right, right. But odds are the guy in the other odds are you aren't posting your address so the guy in the other neighborhood doesn't know who you are anyway. So I don't mind post I, I live here in Metro Atlanta. I don't mind posting my, my pictures of my firearm. There's no one that knows why I live outside my family and my girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> a couple friends. Okay. Now the government does know. So when I hear so when I see folks print these posts well. The government's going to come get you eventually because you're posting these pictures. The ATF already knows when you go out and buy that firearm, and let's assume you bought it legally, okay, the ATF already has a list of people with the firearms, the FBI. That's how That's how during Katrina, the feds were able to go from house to house confiscating. They had a list. They knew already, but you know, a lot of times they claim the ATF doesn't have a list. And it, for me, with, with recent changes in... Um intelligence you know they talk about right. cointel pro um, right there's even something bigger than cointel pro that is tied into it they call it what five eyes where they share communications between like five major countries so it's like at the end of the day if you're using any kind of form of communication electronically mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. nine times out of ten you're you're already in the system you're already wrapped up right exactly Exactly. So, which is which is why I don't mind when I buy a firearm. I don't mind posting it on Facebook. 
because the government already knows. There's not there's not one federal agency that doesn't know that you have five AR-15s. Not because you didn't post it or did post it on Facebook, but because when you went to yet when you went to that pawn shop and bought it, or when you built it, okay, and you ordered those parts, guess what? Some of that you had to register. So they already know that to begin with. And I'm not talking about the the under the cover weapons that you have in your arsenal that they don't know about. No, I'm talking about those first initial ones that you have. So when they do come for it, like they did to Katrina, okay, and the NRA didn't say anything. You remember that? Yeah, remember they, NRA I don't remember say? hearing anything from them. No, because, because why? Because the majority of those home the, those homes were African American homes, and the majority of the gun owners whose guns they confiscated were African Americans. Now I'm not saying that there were no white or Hispanic or Asian gun owners in New Orleans after Katrina during the Katrina storm that the feds didn't confiscate, but the vast majority of the firearms that were confiscated were African American gun owners. And strangely enough, the Second Amendment, come get it crowd, you know, don't trade on me crowd, they had nothing to say about that. Nothing. I wonder if going back to, on, on this going back to original, I'm sorry, going back to the original question, well, what do you do with, you know, if if your weapons cache is flooded, you know, I don't know. If, you, if you've got one of those high-end safes that are waterproof, I guess you're fine. If you don't, well, I guess you just have to hope for the best. Because there's just some firearms, you know, once they submerge on the water for a while, that's it. Yeah, it might be, I guess, a contingency point to look at waterproof uh, cases for your ammunition and for right. your firearms as well. Oh, that and that's a good that's a good question because you know this is Texas, this is Houston. Everybody has a gun. Everybody has a gun. So that's going to be interesting how that's how that plays out. Uh, you would hope that. Some of the more some people have uh, firearms insurance to take care of, it, but a lot of people who are working class, middle class folks, they're not carrying insurance on their firearms. They're not, and the reason they're not is because, well, do I pay? Do I want to pay that extra twenty, thirty dollars a month in firearms insurance, or do I need gas? Here's real talk. This is real talk. I think, you I need, think everybody can relate to that point. <laughs> right. Right, you know where I'm going with this. Okay, the firearms insurance that the NRA peddles, and there's nothing wrong with fi there's nothing wrong with firearms insurance. What I'm saying is, do you take the thirty dollars a month and pay the firearms insurance, or do you put the thirty dollars in your truck because you got to get the kids to school every day? Okay, for two hundred ten days out the year. That's yeah, major life choices. Major okay, decisions. Uh, okay, made. okay. Do, do you pay the thirty dollars a month, or do you need that extra thirty dollars because you your baby you just had a new baby, and guess what? Those pampers are getting real expensive. That thirty dollars is going to really help <laughs> with some formula. Okay, so you know I I I get it. I, I I really do. Which is which goes back to the original point why so many people had a hard time evacuating. You had people that just couldn't afford it. I'm I'm sorry I hate to go back to the original point, but I was just tying it all back to to what you're saying. No, that, that's 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 good. It's, it, it gives clarity for people that are watching, people that might tune in afterwards. As that, right? How we got to that point. Uh, it also makes me wonder how many people were prepared beforehand or waited last minute. You know, with news reports and, and people saying we got this mm -hmm. hurricane coming. How many, I guess, displaced or, or stranded people could we have prevented if we were prepared? Well, I think. I, I think you got a mixture. Okay, so you got some folks who've been through hurricane after hurricane. And they probably thought, you know what? Category four, no big deal. This thing isn't going to touch land. They waited, they waited, they waited. Okay. And this actually did happen because you have people that sit, you know, we get tornado watches and warnings all the time here in Atlanta. Every, from starting next month, September, from September to November, we'll get a tornado warning or watch. Okay, that's just tornado season here in Georgia, and then during the summer we'll get we'll get some of them between April and May, but the bulk of them start in September through November. Okay, and it's nothing uncommon to hear, um, you know, you, your phone's going off with the alerts, you know, with the little alerts, your phone telling you, hey, look, there's a tornado warning, a tornado watch, and sometimes you just it becomes white noise, and unfortunately, a, a lot of people succumb to that, and they. They didn't heed it, and you got some people that just they hurt, and they just didn't they just didn't believe they weren't prepared because they just couldn't afford to be prepared. 
Okay. Being prepared takes discipline. Being prepared means, you know, that extra $20 I pay on the lottery ticket, I might want to put it into some MREs. You know, I might want to put it into <laughs> those non perishable rations that you're going to need in case you need to eat. Right. I might want to put it into putting together not a bug out bag, but a bug out case for my family. I might want to put it into put it in some water or something. So, um, lifestyle you know lifestyle. it's just a lifestyle more more education yeah. about uh financing too um, right exactly and this is this is something that doesn't doesn't cost a lot of money I mean, because creating your emergency getaway kit or your bug out bag or your emergency preparedness ration kit that's not something that's going to take money out your pocket you're actually, you're investing back in yourself all you're doing is curtailing some some immediate gratification and preparing for the future. Now, if nothing ever happens to the day you die, that's a good thing. But I would rather you have spent over the course $20, $50 a month putting together some emergency rations, a flotilla bag, boat, whatever have you, and nothing happens, then something happens like in Houston and you're not, and you're not prepared. Exactly. I mean, there's, there's no need to repeat Katrina again. No. no. I believe that situations like that can be avoidable to an extent. Maybe not in all. Maybe not in mm -hmm. all. But I think that there's things that we can do to, to make the situation a little better if it happens again. Right. And learn to swim. So, oh, that's a, another very good point. There's a lot of people within the community that don't know how to swim. Yeah. Um, if you live in a coastal area, you need to learn how to swim. If you live in Savannah, Georgia, here, uh, Savannah is southeast of where I live. I'm away in the metro landlocked part of Georgia. If you live in Augusta, if you live, in any, if you live anywhere in a coastal area, I don't care how many miles inland from, from the coast you live. Okay, because there were plenty, because guess what? There were people who lived in the northern Houston area, and, and mind you, all of Houston is flooded underwater. We're talking about miles and miles of water, of, of water now, okay? So there were people that lived way inland from the coast, okay? So if you live in a coastal city, Los Angeles, <laughs> you know, yeah, okay, you, there you, go. You, should know, you should know how to swim. You should take some swimming lessons. I don't care how old you are, how old you don't think that, you, you know, you got some people who they hit a certain age and they're like, you know what? I'm past that time to learn anything. No, no. Get out there and learn how to swim. That's really important. A lot of deaths occurred in Katrina and a lot of deaths um, were contributed this time. And, he's, and people are still dying, mind you, because the second phase of the storm is still hitting. Okay, because the levees have started to break and and and, and collapse. So you got people who are going to end up um, being trapped or either washed away because they they can't swim. I'm not talking about people who can't swim against the tide or something. That's a whole different type of swimmer. I'm just talking about basic. Okay, do you can you tread water? Can you backstroke? Can you can you do a swan something? You know something something that gets you twenty feet. I went to CNN to check what when hurricane season ends, and it runs mm -hmm. from June 1st to November 30th uh, in the Atlantic. Wow. So this is just August. We still got September, October, three more months. Three more months yeah. of hurricane season. So, I mean, we're at Harvey right now, so that lets us know how many hurricanes we've already had and how much longer we have to have any additional hurricanes. Exactly. And typically when you got a big one, because you remember you had Katrina and then a few weeks later you had this, uh, I forget the name of you, you had this big ass other one that came right behind it. And it looked like it was, you know, it was up down in the West Indies. It looks like for a minute it was about to turn around and hit the same location again. Um, so, uh, again, it just shows that we got to be prepared. And um, my hat is off to the survivalists that are always preaching and you know, sometimes they can be a little paranoid and um, conspiracy theorists, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, re no, really. Have you ever talked to someone who's a survivalist? They, uh, they, they are a strange conspiratorial group of people. They are. But let me tell you something. They've got a lot of wealth of knowledge when it comes to being prepared and prepping. And, you know, I don't even try to debate that with them. They're, they're absolutely right. Now, there are some other nuances they get into. And you're like, okay, really? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's good that we got a chance to kind of sit down and talk, um, right? Briefly over over the stuff, but 
it, it's given me an idea of where I need to improve things. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I attached uh, in the group, you know, some of the questions that, that you gave me. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I should add them to the description. I got to figure some kind of way to tie them in, but all of the questions that you, you ask are valid. They all make sense, and it, it, I think it, it's something that people can look at and, and kind of critique themselves. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be us saying, hey, are you doing this? Are you doing this? But it could be something that people ask themselves. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, so one of the, one, I know one of the questions that I asked on, on page, I think it was maybe number 13 or number, or number 14, and I asked one particular person who was ranting on about, well, what the city didn't do or what the state did do as far as the cresting of the water. And I said, okay, well, if you got a lake that's overflowing and the dike is bursting right then. Now, mind you, the city's already flooded. So the reservoirs, so if the city's flooded, that means the reservoirs are peaked. So the reservoirs are peaked. Now, people don't know what the reservoirs are. Each, each major city has a reservoir of fresh water. And you've got these dikes and levees that are built around to keep it in. In case right. you have a flood. Okay. Now, in the case of Atlanta, we probably don't. I don't know that we have any levees because we're not a coastal city. But I'm sure you we have some dikes to keep it in. So you you got you, you got this torrential water rain that comes in along with flooding, and it starts to break and collapse. So I asked the person, well, what do you do in real time? I mean, you, you got to you, you, you said that the city didn't do it correctly. What would you do in real time then when the levees are breaking right then and the water is cresting? You've got seawater coming inward okay you got water coming down how would you prevent that there's no way to prevent it because you wouldn't know that it was happening right you, you can't that's something you can't anticipate you can't anticipate a damn breaking it's something that, so what i'm i'm from fayetteville and we've got issues where we have old dams that are falling apart or aren't functioning properly and right. i'm willing to to put money on it in Hurricane Katrina. And in this case, they've got things that are outdated when it comes to service. Like like whatever was holding the water back in the, in the reservoirs, they may have needed to be updated. Looking at the Hurricane Katrina situation, it should have been something done ahead of time. Right. The one thing that probably could have been done, and, and Mayor, um, I think Mayor Nagin had said, he said he probably could have done a better job at, and, and some of that laid on the governors too, in general speak, they said they laid out, They could have done probably done a better job in coordinating and communicating with one another, mm -hmm. because both of them were getting conflicting information from FEMA, and we all know FEMA dropped the ball big time on that because, it, you know, FEMA. It, it, I mean, FEMA was out the lunch. They were really out the lunch that day. But at at some point, I expect the, the the city and the state to be able to coordinate something with each other. I don't expect them to work off a miracle because, as we said, there's Again, how do you how do you prepare for an evacuation of six point five million people when this doesn't happen? In order to prepare for it, you have to have practice. Have to have practice. The only way they practice this is with computer simulations. They model <clears throat> these these engineers and these preppers, um, these preppers that work for the federal government, the state government, and local governments. These urban planners they prep this stuff on computer simulation. Well, a computer can only tell you so much. It can't tell you that. Oh, you know what? You've got. 500 seniors that are on dialysis machines. Right. It doesn't okay. take those variables into consideration if you don't. Right. Them. right. You, you've got 1,200 babies um, that were born citywide today. <laughs> and you, you know, the computer doesn't take that into consideration. So quite naturally, people aren't, th people aren't thinking, well, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you go about evacuating it? How do you do it? So, you know, it's interesting to see all the people Monday morning quarterbacking it, but so far no one's been able to answer those series of questions. Well, another thing I I think a lot, man, a lot crosses my mind in cases like this. So it's mm -hmm. like, how long did the Katrina situation happen? How long did you know were, were, were the floodwaters there? How long were people displaced? And how long do we think it's going to be in this case in Houston? This is worse than Katrina because Houston is Houston is much bigger than New Orleans. Ooh. And you remember, 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 as I said earlier, um, the entire city of Houston up to its outlaying areas, it was nothing but a marshland and swamp before um, 
before the settlers came because what because the Native Americans didn't even sell it. There was just some place that they just passed through because they the Native Americans knew, like, you know what? This is not a good place because through oral history they found out this place floods a lot. Right. So we're not gonna sell it here. So as technology grew, you know, people decided, you know, this is a good place to build a city. We'll build these dikes, dams, we'll pump the water out, we'll we'll maintain, we'll tame nature. Okay. But when you get these hundred year storms, these fifty year storms that come through, you know, God's got a whole different kind of plan to mess your plan up. But yeah. going back to Katrina, you know, yeah, going back to Katrina, you know, that that had gone on for days before federal and state state agencies stepped in. You remember the one picture of the elderly lady? I don't know if you remember this. Um, she had I, I don't know why the news showed this, it, but it burned in my memory. She had written her name on her arm. No, not her arm. I'm sorry, on a piece of paper. She died in a wheelchair with her name, age, and address. And um, if you could probably go out and find the pictures, it, it's still out there somewhere on social media, probably on a Bing or Google search. That's why. And yeah, she someone had covered her up, and she was there, and because she knew. I don't know if she she was under, if she ran out her medicine or whatnot. But see, that goes back to again what I was talking about. There are certain things and variables you can't plan for. Right. So how do you plan for a woman in a wheelchair who may need medical attention? You need to get to her. How do you plan for that? So, so I guess she thought maybe she, rest, help was coming at some point. I'm going to put this here. When they find me, they'll get me to the hospital. I'll be all right. I mean, she probably did know in the back of her mind that she was going to pass, or maybe she did. But I tell you what, she prepared herself. That Again, that's going back to being prepared. It's like, you know what? I need to at least find somebody to take my body if something happens, which is, um, you know, which is why you... I'm not trying to think this way. I guess if a storm, something like this hits, you know, you, you have a dog tag on you. You have some type of identification marker. So if, if your body is found, you know, your family, your family at least can come full circle and find some closure. Absolutely. So we, I mean, from the, what I'm taking away from the situation is we want to, we want to kind of stress the importance of survival skills. Yeah. I think having the, the set of skills together with the plan, you know, for a set amount of time gives you an idea of how long you have to survive and what you do if your survival, I guess plan needs to be altered. You know, if you, if you run out of food, where do you get new food from if there's no kind of support from the government? Um, right. Having a community sense, I think, is also good, you know, because mm -hmm. you mentioned it way earlier that uh, waiting or relying on the government to do so, it's going to put a lot of people in a bad position. So. Right. We do need to kind of unify and come up with plans uh, as a community. You know, individual plans are good, but what happens when you put a bunch of individuals who have plans in place together? Then they, it's not a case where you have to worry about the government coming to aid. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we got a question from Nikki in the chat. What are some basic tools we can carry in our car for survival? Uh, what about you, Dex? What do you carry in your car for survival? You have well. Well, this is a gun group, so first of all, first of all, I carry my Glock forty three, <laughs> my okay, Glock twenty one. Okay. okay, that's the first. Of, that's first and foremost. I carry a I carry a pocket knife. I, I have a I, I drive a Dodge Ram, so I, I my seat lets up in the back. So Nikki, what I do, I I keep the Glock twenty one in a lockbox in back. Even if someone broke in, it couldn't take it because it's bolted. Okay, um, I keep a machete. I've got a knife, the knife I keep on me, and it's a legal carry knife here in Georgia, so I can keep that I can keep that on a pocket side on me. Now, because of what I do in the financial industry, I obviously can't wear that around customers. Right. But I, I do keep that in a little briefcase that I have. Um, I make sure that I have some rope in the truck. Uh, I make sure I also have some toiletries. I keep a blanket in here. You know, it drives it drives my girl crazy because she's like, You're gonna go to sleep in the thing or something? But you never know. You never know. <laughs> you, but you don't, seriously, you don't know. Okay. I keep, I, I got a pack of MREs in here. That's you good. know, I do. I got a little pack, I got a little pack of MREs in here it, and some beef jerky. And a lot of times when I'm driving down the road, I'm tempted to eat it because I'm hungry. But I got to remember myself, no, this is your emergency. This is your emergency or something goes wrong. Okay. You stuck. So I at least have three days worth of MREs. And, um, and she may not know what MREs are. That's, uh, 
what, what was her name? I'm sorry, her name was That's Nikki. Uh, Mills was ready to eat. MREs or Mills. Okay. Ready. Repeat that for Mills ready to eat. Okay. So, so Nikki, you can go to an army surplus store, or, you know, if you want to be bougie like me, you can go to one of these fancy websites <laughs> and you can buy you some of the higher grade MREs. I mean, they're really good. They got like steak and potato, cheese, uh, cheese steak, stuff like that, man. Uh, MREs have come a long way since the old military days. But, you got uh, time for being bougie, man. Give me that military one. I'm straight. <laughs> <laughs> what, is it, but, what is it? The beef stew or the beef stroganoff, I think, is probably my favorite. Yeah, the beef stroganoff. Don't that don't sleep on that beef stroganoff now, man. That be hey, that I don't I will admit I am a bougie survivalist, bro. <laughs> well, hey, Jack, so, I mean, you know, uh pretty soon we're gonna we're gonna have uh, a website that available on our website, BGOE. Uh we're getting things set up to to have stuff specific specifically for surviving, you know, survival kits, okay. bug out bags, we shit hits okay. the fan bags, whatever the case is, we're gonna start having uh, items that are, we would suggest right. for you to put together in a bag. Um, oh, and, and Nikki, tell Nikki she needs to also have that because I'm because we're men, but she's got but she's a female, so you got to. So Nikki, you need to have those things that women need in your in your survival thing in your survival bag. Okay, so those things like that stuff that guys are afraid to go pick up for y'all when you ask us to get them at the store. <laughs> those things. Yeah, you can just say products. You know that makes that covers all of that, man. I, I think according <laughs> to the military, right? If I'm not mistaken, correct me. Uh, I think when women go to the field, I think it's it's a three day minimum that they can go without showering. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I believe that's the case. And um, oh, and also toothbrush never hurts. Toothbrush, toothpaste. What I what I what I started doing because um, my um my brother Sean, who spent like 20 years in the military, I mean. He, he he just didn't he didn't want to retire. He just kept going in and out. He keeps a box of baking soda, you know, in his rather than baking toothpaste. soda. I got he baking keeps, soda. And yeah, and the reason he keeps baking soda is because he says, well, I can only do one thing with the toothpaste. With the baking soda, I can do a couple things. It's the toothpaste is a deodorant. I can use it to clean stuff with. Okay, so that's why he, that's why he uses the baking soda. So he's got a big box of baking soda he keeps in his um little emergency kit. What about your uh, your bug out bag for home? Uh, is it different from the one that you carry in the vehicle? The one that the one that the survivalists were laughing at on on the uh, in the group page. Yes. Okay. So a couple months ago, I posted a picture of my bug out bag in the more serious survivalists. Because, like I said, I'll admit I'm not a I'm not a a hardcore survivalist. I don't keep some of the other I don't keep what some of the other guys do, but I got a hard time for it. So my bug out bag consists of a knife, some toiletries, um, I've got a flint rock, I've got some flares, uh, Nikki, I got some rope I keep in there. I've got some fish hooking rope because I got a fish. Okay. Also I keep a um I got a little box of three three eights I keep in there. Okay, because if I can get home and get to my um get to my Remington that I will use that over my um 308 because I rather use the, th the 338 I mean the 30 out six rather I've got okay. a 30 out six I just bought but I got a 338 that I've had for for some time so if I can get home and get to that during a crisis I'd rather use the 338 because it's more is a more high power round than the, than the 30 out six even though the 30 out six you can just not kill anything you know any kind of animal in North America with it probably some in central too yeah, but, I think yeah. So I keep that. Situation is you have both bags that even increases your chances of survival. You know, you got one in your car already. You're at home right. or near home when situations like this take place. Having that extra bag is going to go a long ways for you know because you you got extra right. materials that can go towards ensuring right. your your safety or survival. Wow. And I keep an extra pair of glasses. I keep an extra pair of glasses. And oh, and believe it or not, and believe it or not, a book. And see, when I posted all that, all the hardcore survivors were laughing at me. They were like, well, that's some bullshit you got there. Because it wasn't, in their mind, it wasn't a serious bag because I didn't have a lot of MREs. I didn't have this. I didn't have that. I didn't have the like water purifier, which I did. It's a little bottle um, filtration unit that goes on top of the bottle. Yeah. 
you know, the filtered water. Now you don't have that, which I didn't. So I went out immediately and I bought all that stuff after being John and, and heckled for about two or three weeks in the group page. Yeah, I was going to test on that. You took it right out of my mouth, the, the water purified. It's good because you need clean drinking water if you don't know how to make clean drinking water, right? Right, right. Or if you and don't it, have the ability to make it. Let's say the water source is contaminated. You can, you can boil it assuming how contaminated the water is because there's certain contaminants you can't boil out. Right. Um, there was a 60-minute story a couple years ago. Um, I think Maury... Uh, I want to say Maury was at Anderson Cooper. Um, they were doing a uh, story on this company that supposedly sold some kind of machine that could purify through using iodine radioactive water. Okay. okay. Supposedly. Now, the experts would tell you there's no way to purify radioactive water, you know, where, where humans can drink it. Right. Okay. Right. And there, there's some, right. And there's some survivalists that'll disagree with what I just said. They'll, post some links to that particular site and the, the name of it escapes me, but I remember this. Um, they had, they had the guy on and they interviewed him. Then they went back to the EPA and they went to some uh, other scientists to show that, okay, this device really can't purify radioactive water to a point where it's safe to drink for humans. Okay. So that, so I think, I, I think one, you, you, you obviously, you need the means to purify water. There are different ways to do it. I say the most basic way, which people have always done it for years, is boiling it, and that's to kill the parasites. Because first of all, I mean, if it's drinkable, if we know it's drinkable, no smell, and we can tell, we want to make sure we don't have any amoebas in it. <laughs> yeah, those are no good for you. Right. We we don't we we don't want anything that's going to give us cholera. I don't think anyone gets cholera in North America because of. Um, the filtration systems in our water in our water applications here, but let's just hypothetically say you've got floods that occur frequently, like in Houston. You may run that risk, so you want to make sure that um, that you have the means. Also, soap or some kind of decontaminant that you, because you've got people who've been swimming through this contaminated water, and it is contaminated water, you know, because you've got fecal matter that people have been walking through. In Houston, that's mixed with that's mixed with water coming in from the sea and the lakes. Okay, so you don't know what's on your skin. So you so hand sanitizer like this. This is fine, but you need something that's going to really kill the germs and bacteria on you. I mean, this is fine for me driving around with putting my hands. I'm going to stop by a store to get something to eat. Right. But I think you need. I I think if, I, I I don't know in the names of any. I think that's where we get one of these one of one of our more. Um, serious survivalists to come in and tell us, well, what do you, what do you use in this case to get that kind of stuff off? Because you're going to, you're going to need that. Absolutely. Uh, I, I got to think of something uh, of on what we're going to do as a, a follow up to this, because it, like I said, hurricane season is, is all the way until November. So right. I, I definitely want to try to get as much information out to people as possible while hurricane season is going. And not, not to be the only time that we give information, but in, in general situations, you know, you mentioned the ice storm. That, that's another thing that comes after hurricane season. What happens if it gets cold and we're in another case where it powers out for a week or two? Right. In, in the case where we have here in Atlanta, we get these ice storms, intermediate, these intermediate ice storms that shut the road down. And people, people from up north don't understand. They think we're, we're closing the city because of snow. No, we're closing the city. We're closing Metro Atlanta. There are 13 counties in Metro Atlanta. Atlanta, we, we call it. We call all 13 counties Atlanta, city of Atlanta. So you get this black ice on the road. This black ice is not like black ice you get in Carolina where you at or this black ice like someone gets in Ohio. No, this is black, thick ice. And people typically don't buy tires for that kind of ice. You know this. Well, hey, I mean, with that in the roads down there, hey, we get some serious black ice now. Yeah. Yeah, but people, but you know how much ice tires and snow tires cost. Nobody in Atlanta spending the money. Come on, I don't. I drive a four by four. I'm not about to go spend a seventy dollars on the tires for those for those tires. You know, I'm not going to get an ice storm, but every four or six years, yeah, it'd be different <laughs> if you live somewhere where it's colder, where they get a lot of snow. Awesome, right? Yes. Right. So I just get some chains. I got some chains I put on the tire. You know, because that's just it costs less. 
you know, I don't have to worry about maintaining. Yeah, uh, yeah. What was yes, that? We're gonna, wrap, we're gonna wrap it up, man. We ain't gonna keep people too much longer. I, th I think we touched on okay. some very good uh, topics. Okay. Uh, okay. Raise some very good questions. Um, if there's anything else you want to add to it, or, or no, guess, brother, that, that is that is it. I'm just making okay. sure. Everyone, it was great. It was great speaking with y'all. All right, until we sign back on, yo, this is Black Gun Owners in Education. Brad and Tactical Snowflake over and out.